Welcome everyone to Zero virtually and to our special education week update on carbon accounting, which we're really delighted to present with Sunday, with whom Zero has a global partnership. Uh, the CEO of Sunday, Jess Richmond, is with us here. But before we kick off, I'd like to start with a welcome to country. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm hosting this webinar today, which is the land of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, as well as the traditional owners and custodians of the various lands from which you're all learning and working. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And I'll just run through what's on the agenda today. First, we're going to uh, introduce you to the basic concept of carbon accounting. And then Jess from Someday will talk to you about how to get started with Someday. Uh, and she'll go on to talk to you about the zero and Someday integration. We will be joined during this uh, session by Alyssa Maha from ER Advisory and Emily Green from Bentley's. They're both experienced accountants who have been doing carbon accounting and they can speak to the practical applications of the zero and someday integration and how to use it with your clients. You'll be hearing from them at different points uh, regularly throughout the webinar and uh, you can also address questions to them in the chat. I want to cover briefly what is carbon accounting. Essentially, it's about quantifying the carbon emissions from the operations and value chain of a business calculate and record emissions in a carbon ledger, which is just like a general accounting ledger, but it's for carbon. There is a global standard for carbon accounting that's called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, and Jess will talk to that um, a little bit more. And we'll also talk about different scopes of emissions. That's a term that you'll hear used. Scope one is direct energy that you control in your business. For many people, that's things like fuel in a fleet vehicle, um, scope two is indirect energy that you use but don't necessarily directly control. Um, so that might be, for example, the base building electricity and gas in the office where you are. And scope three is your value chain. So suppliers and in some cases, the customers and how they use your product. And how do we quantify that? It's basically maths using zero data. That's how I'd explain it. So a lot of the inputs are things you already have available, and Jess will go into that uh, in more detail. You multiply those by an emissions factor. Jess is going to explain what that is. Um, and that gives you a carbon uh, footprint, which is expressed as tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, regardless of the actual greenhouse gases involved. So it might be methane from cows, but we express the whole carbon footprint as tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted. Um, it's pretty simple to get your head around. You're all smart people who are accountants and you understand how to do this probably much better than I do. Um, but someone who's a super expert in this area is Jess Richmond, the CEO and founder of um, Someday, which is a fabulous uh, Australian company that we're really excited to work with globally. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Jess to take you through the nuts and bolts of carbon accounting and how Someday can help. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Tam. Uh, very good uh, intro. Thanks for setting that foundation. As Tam said, we'll sort of step into some of these concepts. But at the at the beginning, we like to kind of look at the context. Why are we really talking about this uh, now? And so one thing that's really changed this year, um, what actually happened around June was an International Sustainability Standards Board passed down two new um, audit standards effectively and within those it said if you are a large organisation like a public company um, or your revenue is at a certain threshold or you're a bank or a financier, you are going to have an obligation uh, to report on your carbon emissions. And so for the first time, a, a sustainability standards board passed down what very much feels like audit and accounting standards. And then what's happened, and it's open right now, here in Australia, for example, the government is now looking at how we adopt those standards locally. And currently that consultation is basically saying we're going to follow pretty much uh, what that international standards has said. 
Uh, and the Accounting Standards Board is now looking at making that our domestic accounting standards. And so really, again, for the first time, we're moving beyond fluffy sort of back of the envelope discussions around carbon accounting into a world where there's an accounting standard referring to a global standard on how the carbon accounting needs to be done. And as Tam said, um, that's called the GHG protocol. And that protocol really looks at the various uh, categories of emissions. It sets out the methods like you would be used to reading. And most accountants flick through that and go, aha moment, this is largely accounting. And now we see this huge regulatory shift and you can see those headlines from all around the world where now we're talking about the idea that maybe the accountants should be involved or the CFOs or the controllers because it is an accounting standard and it is something that ends up disclosed at the big end of town, but it's something that starts to impact risk as well as commercial opportunity across our SMBs as well. So how do we get the right people in the arena? Um, which is, you know, we're talking to those right people today. This is really something that's transitioning into that sort of compliance landscape. And again, I think it's really important. A lot of uh, firms might think, well, if I have these enormous clients, um, if I can say is my client, that's one thing. We've got this whole sort of compliance piece that everyone is going to be caught up in from 2024, 2025. But what happens if your clients are not the big end of town and, and caught within these compliance standards instantly? And so this is where we like to provide, you know, context on how this is impacting SMBs and the majority of the clients that we have. And really this is coming back to one of the accounting uh, or methods or frameworks where we talk about scope three emissions. So as Tam said, really those global standards say you can account for your fuel, you can account for your electricity, but here is a category of purchase goods and services in scope three that's going to say every time you spend a dollar with another company on goods or services, their emissions form part of your emissions. And you can imagine how complex that is and why the whole world is grappling with difficulty around this, because even if we think of a coffee shop, it means we need to know the emissions of the uh, cups that we buy, the beans, the salt and pepper on the tables. You know, it's, it's extensive of how do we get this information. And most people don't have that primary data. Your clients certainly, chances are, won't have that primary data as well. And so really now what we're seeing is uh, to date, everyone has relied on industry averages to do those calculations. But there's a real problem because if we're relying on industry averages, if I'm the cafe or the restaurant, I never really get to know what are the real emissions associated with the suppliers I'm choosing to buy my wine or my coffee beans from. And if I'm entering a world where I'm rewarded for reducing my emissions or being sustainable, then I'm really trying to get my emissions down. But if the whole thing's based on industry averages or proxy data, how will I ever do that? And you can see how that's an annoying problem for your SMB clients, but it's a very, very big problem for the top end of town who now have to, for the first time, start disclosing to the market their total emissions and also the uncertainty associated with those emissions. And if 90% of their footprint is based on goods and services or that sort of scope three, then that's a pretty uncertain assessment if the whole thing is based on industry averages. And that's not really sitting well now. So as a result of that regulatory shift, as a result of that pressure to tangibly reduce emissions, and as a result of pressure to bring more credibility and robustness to carbon accounting, we're seeing really large organisations start to put pressure on their supply chains to actually get real information from those that they buy goods and services from. So whether that's an Amazon, some of the biggest companies in the world saying to their suppliers, from 2024, you have to give me this data, or it's more local, a coal saying, well, by 2027, all of these suppliers we buy from, I want them to have their own net zero targets, which cannot credibly be done if they don't understand their emissions in the first place. 
And we're seeing it with organisations like Fonterra, who obviously buy milk from a lot of our local farmers across Australia and New Zealand. All of these organisations are under pressure to understand the true emissions of those they engage with. And that pressure is getting pushed down, which is why we're starting to expect that over the next couple of years, particularly next year, a need to understand at least where clients are starting from is becoming really key. So a key question that you know we all get asked, and someday it certainly started as an accounting firm itself, this is all one thing. The standards are coming, it hits the big end of town, maybe the taps on the shoulder are coming, maybe there's this value here, but like a, a client's actually going to pay their accountants uh, to actually deliver this as a service to them. You know, we all probably are excited by the opportunity to work on high impact things. Certainly this is great for retention and attraction of talented staff who want to work on this sort of next era of accounting. But it still needs to be a, a, a profitable uh, service that we're building around this. And is that reality? And is that sitting there? And so this is something that is a common question. And I will throw to Emily and Alyssa who have clients that pay for this exact service. But I'll just touch on some of the key reasons why these uh, particularly SMB clients are coming on uh, and engaging their clients or using Someday in the first place. So the first is, say, marketing without the greenwashing risk. Everyone wants to promote their company as sustainable at the moment because they're largely getting rewarded for it. We know statistically consumers are trying to make purchasing decisions that they're shopping online or in the supermarket based on is this company sustainable? And a lot of the time, everyone might have a leaf logo or throw around a, a million different claims around sustainability. But now clients are really wanting to cut through on that and say, well, if I'm, I'm actually doing the work to understand my emissions and somebody else isn't, and I'm really consciously tracking this information, there's a story to tell in that about my willingness to do this to a robust level, to commit to it, and to over time share my story around this. So how can I put this on this public billboard, so to speak, whether that's on my websites or it's QR to my products or it's sitting in my email signatures. How do I push that? That's a key reason. Second, we're seeing uh, businesses want to meet stakeholder requirements. So as we talk to sort of financial institutions, most banks are looking at how do we end up making uh, sustainability or carbon actually part of our lending criteria. That's an obvious future that everyone's trying to work towards without it being this insane compliance burden uh, on the businesses, which is really what they're tackling. So a lot of clients kind of know that their banks are either starting to ask gentle questions, uh, their customers are asking them for this data, maybe they're applying for grants that now require carbon emissions to be listed as part of that, or they're submitting tenders where there is now suddenly a very deep section on sustainability and carbon. How can they have a point of difference by being ready to answer those questions or apply to those stakeholders? The third is understanding opportunities to reduce emissions. So for a lot of businesses, you know, it's not rocket science to come up with the obvious. Uh, if you're using fuel, consider an EV, use less electricity if you can. You know, it's kind of like back in the day when we're saying, you know, teaching people, oh, if you would like to be healthier, uh, eat healthier foods. We kind of, there is a base level of understanding that is growing, but a lot of clients now want to understand, well, what can I do beyond that? Can I financially make that make sense? How, what is actually the return on that investment? What are the ways I can do this uh, in a more sophisticated way than just ideas around sustainability that aren't tracked or where the return isn't clear? Uh, and then four is tracking progress. A lot of businesses are now starting to go out of their way to do really great things. Uh, but if they're not carbon accounting at a pretty granular level, uh, 
it's really difficult to actually demonstrate that to their internal or external stakeholders that those things made a difference. Uh, and an example of that is a, a small hotel that the restaurant, the chef had done some amazing work around uh, changing the inventory drop-offs and getting local produce and reducing the waste around that. But there wasn't really granular carbon accounting that meant that any of those things were actually registering as you know, carbon returns on investment or change in process that they could then communicate. So they had a lovely story, but it wasn't really backed up by evidence. And a lot of the time they're trying to get buy-in uh, and they're trying to communicate that story uh, to customers so that they come and they value this. Very hard to do without the data sitting behind it. So I might just take now to get some more practical um, examples. Alyssa, I might start with you. Obviously, you've got some clients that probably fit a few of those um, buckets, but of your paying clients that are engaging your accounting firm to do this as a service, what are some of the practical ways they're using this or why they're valuing this? Yeah, we definitely have clients that fit every bucket under there. Uh, but at the moment, the majority of our clients are looking to differentiate themselves from their competitors and provide the tangible evidence behind the stories so that they can actually show the progress they're making uh, with the data backed behind it. Brilliant. Um, and Alyssa, I'm going to go like concrete on these examples. I know you have um, a small business client in tourism who has like three employees uh, engaged you to do their carbon accounting and then used that in various ways. What did that tangibly look like? What did they do with your data, dashboarding, presenting, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the big picture they've used on their website to be able to display the data and the work they've actually done to assess their emissions and then the progress moving forward. But they're also using that data to establish changes they can make. Uh, so whether that's being moving to electrification or taking away uh, to solar panels completely and looking at it on a location by location basis. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Emily, I think you're the same. You probably have clients um, in all of those kind of buckets, but do you want to just give a few examples of SMB clients paying your firm to do this work and their why? Yeah, so we've also found this, the smaller uh, businesses to be really engaged with this and to really see the value of this as a, a really powerful marketing tool. And in particular, we had a, a really tiny civil construction company um, who engaged us to do this so that they could use this in their tendering documents. They had a lot of uh, contracts with local councils, so they just wanted to be able to use that information and also to identify uh, areas where maybe they can improve. Uh, we also have a small distillery um, his main goal there was just to be able to quantify all the actions he's already been taking for a number of years to improve sustainability uh, on his property um, so that he can actually tell that story. Um, and we've even got, you know, a, a small removalist company, like you can see on the slide there, who also see the value of this. Super helpful. And I think one thing what we've seen and certainly in our experience as an accounting firm, you know, explaining the value of this work is that often it really comes down to a strong understanding of what's practically involved to get started and what the deliverables are, which I know um, that both you guys are very much deeply across and that's really translating into new work because it can be really scary for SMBs to say, oh, as if I'm going to go and pay for carbon accounting and get my accountant involved. And like, that's terrifying. Am I going to be up for tens of thousands of dollars before I even start? And I'm a, you know, 10 person or less uh, company. You know, that's a, that's a scary proposition. But I think what we're seeing well um, are firms that have a really good understanding across their teams to say getting started involves you know, these few things. I might do a readiness assessment for you and understand what data is sitting in zero already, what gaps you might have that mean I can't yet do a full assessment. And articulating that is actually really valuable as well. And then doing a first pass assessment so that they have an understanding of where their baseline is before you go into this really granular level of detail or a full deep assessment 
that is often a really soft entry point for a lot of SMBs who have actually really just been looking for a bit more rigor around this, but someone they already trust, like their existing accountant, to come in and deliver that. So changing our thinking around this is all fluffy or only for the biggest end of town or so complex into actually what are just the deliverables like any other service that I'm providing and I can take that client on a journey and make that fit for purpose for them. I think the firms that are doing that well have seen really great results in terms of that you know, beautiful level of engagement on something that's really important to them in most cases as well. Cool. So we established there's a regulatory shift coming. It's putting pressure down. It's changing the narrative on is carbon accounting back of the envelope nonsense or is it actually becoming accounting? And we accept that that shift is coming. And we look at ways where there is actual tangible value for, for your clients. The next piece is, okay, well, then what is actually involved uh, in doing this? And Tam did um, a great job of obviously setting out, in essence, what is involved. You are essentially, uh, if I talk quite practically here, I guess, you are getting, uh, say, an engagement letter that would say, hello, I would like you as my uh, accountant to deliver me um, a GHG or a carbon emissions assessment for my organisation. So that means that firstly, you're defining the boundary of that organisation, which is a concept under the, under the standards. And you're looking at accounting for the emissions that come from that business in all of the things they do, the fuel they use, the electricity they consume, the goods and services they buy, the waste they produce, the travel that they do. There are categories under the standards that will tell you what you're actually accounting for within the boundary of that business. And as Tam said, number two, uh, there is a global standard. Um, so, you know, whether you're talking the top end of town, the Rio Tintos of the world or the Amazons of the world, you know, they're all using this GHG protocol to underpin the uh, carbon accounting that is essentially published in their reports and you know down to your SMB client you're using the same so having a good understanding of that protocol will kind of definitely be this uh, aha moment as to what is tangibly involved to a degree here as well so third you're looking at the three main categories that everyone is tackling so uh, again you are looking at basically um, the standards cover more detail than this but in essence does the business uh, consume fuel? Do they have vehicles that are doing that? Do I already have that data? Okay, I can do a calculation to determine the emissions associated with that. That's scope one. Um, so in my engagement letter, I probably have a scope one, two and three assessment and then a high level report. So I've done my scope one. My scope two, do I understand the electricity that's being consumed by this organization? Not rocket science. Here I'm looking at the meters um, that the business uh, you know, owns and the electricity that they consume um, or gas, whatever it is that they might be using. Uh, and some businesses won't have that. Say they're in shared offices, all of these things that you can think of that go, that's going to be hard work. The standards provide methodologies for those kind of assumptions. You disclose your gaps, you disclose your reasonable assumptions and you allow your client to sort of move on and improve their data process over time. So you've done that for SOAP 2. Scope 3 is where there's a little bit more involved because there's 15 categories. Um, some of them won't be relevant to your client. You'll be able to do that assessment. But this is where for most SMB clients, you're looking at uh, all of the financial transactions for the reporting period, uh, pulling those in and doing an assessment. And I'll speak to that in a moment. You'd be looking at their travel and waste. And again, this is for some businesses going to be kind of like the shoebox full of receipts at tax time. Some people are going to have poor quality data or it's not going to be set out um, in a lot of detail, but you can always disclose that and try and help them improve that. And that's actually a, a really valuable advisory service as well. And then for the inputs that you already have because you're their accountant and you're using a lot of this data is really then multiplied by this you know, emissions factor number to say, well, if I spent $10,000 on sand at Bunnings, um, how does that end up being um, an equivalent amount of uh, carbon? We're using a conversion or a factor or an emissions factor to say, well, this is the average of 
sand. Um, and this is now what I'm going to multiply by that spend. And I'll explain that a little further, but that's where um, Someday provides that data for you to do that calculation. Before we move on from that, though, obviously, you know, you think about what the engagement is um, and what you're being asked to do and the availability of some of that data. Um, Alyssa, I might just go to you. In terms of uh, your real life experience, when a client comes and asks for this, how do you generally break up um, the engagement? Is it following this? And how do you find the availability of data? Yeah, I think our first step with breaking down an engagement is to actually look at the client's zero file uh, and check where we can fix some of the data before we even start the assessment. So most of the time, you have to dive in, look for the receipt within a transaction, look for the right page on the receipt to even find the consumption details, say for fuel and electricity. So to make that data a lot more easier so that when we automatically pull it through to Sunday, uh, it's all there in one spot instead of having to dig back through to the invoices. Perfect. Um, and Emily, uh, in your experience in terms of for that small, say, construction company, for example, how do you guys break down what you're actually delivering? Does it follow this? And how have you found sort of dealing with the availability of that data as well? Yeah, so there's certainly been challenges with uh, getting all the data that we we need for this. Um, for most of our clients, most of it has been captured in a zero file, but in the cases where it hasn't, like perhaps this uh, construction company, um, it's just been about asking a lot of questions, doing a lot of digging, making a lot of, assump of assumptions, um, and just making sure we disclose all of those uh, in our report, and then working closely with the client to try and get them improving the data that they're keeping uh, so we can improve their future assessments and just really improve that data quality over time. That better yep <laughs> great so thanks guys that's really helpful and I think it's like really important to yeah be talking about what does this practically play out like for clients so that we actually are all sort of building that confidence to have the discussion and deal with the fact that most of the time a lot of the data isn't sitting there perfectly and there's a lot of value to add in helping improve that over time so then I guess we get to this point around, um, you know, upskilling the team and how do you build the confidence to have those conversations in the first place or to actually just deeply know what is generally going to be required to deliver this work? Because once people in your team have that level of understanding, that's when it becomes a pretty relaxed conversation with existing clients to say, you know, obviously this might not be your number one priority in the world, but it's actually not this huge engagement for us to kind of start incorporating carbon accounting into how we do your accounting and reporting now. Uh, and would you like to sort of start looking at that, perhaps get an idea of what your baseline is now and know where you stand so that if things change, if customers ask or there is a good opportunity or the bank wants this or whatever it might be that we can kind of make a pretty fair assessment will be something that uh, comes our way in the next 12 months. We're ready to do that and it's not a big deal. Getting that level of confidence is really key and it really just comes down to like anything else, having a good understanding uh, of what's practically involved. So a key starting point for most firms, um, this is you know, accounting firms, whether they're the biggest ones in the world, um, small bookkeeping practices, small accountants, you'd be probably surprised that despite any flashy websites on sustainability, everyone is learning and everyone is trying to understand what is actually practically involved in delivering this. And so that means we have a really clear step one um, when firms start looking at this. And that really is around education. Someday is really big on making sure that, you know, we're playing a role in sharing knowledge and making sure that, you know, we're teaching everyone in our industry as much as we can um, 
how to fish rather than say, send your client to us and we'll do it all for you. Um, or, you know, we'll explain it all. How do we actually build knowledge as an accounting profession to make sure that we, you know, own this new space as it comes in and that we're there to add value to clients? So one of the key things is getting people access to the practical knowledge and education. There's a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of courses out there that talk about ESG at like a pretty high level or like sustainability conceptually or carbon accounting conceptually. And there's endless resources out there for that. Um, some days it's far more boring in that we really try and dig into the depths of if I'm an accountant or a bookkeeper or an auditor and I have an engagement what do I practically need to do or know about these standards? What practical examples do I need to be working through? What does the template Excel file need to look like, let alone something in the software? And what is it practically? So we have an introduction to carbon accounting course, which goes across 18 chapters and really dives into this. And people do this in their own time. Some people take two days, some people take a month. Um, you know, it's, it's self-directed learning. It's meant to be very comprehensive and it's go to the other links of where uh, additional resources might sit. But it is really just designed to say, well, okay, this is my core foundation um, and I can now build on that and have confident, comfortable conversations that add a lot of value to my clients. Uh, Alyssa and Emily, obviously both of you, your firms have been going through um, this type of education. Maybe Emily, I'll throw to you first. Uh, what is the difference, I guess, when you're coming into this and you might not have done foundational education versus how have you experienced that upskilling and what value has that brought to you and the firm? Yeah, so we've found the Someday Academy to be hugely valuable. Um, personally, my background is not in accounting, so um, we found the introduction to carbon accounting to be really great to just step through everything, outline what's in the GHD, GHD protocol in an engaging way with uh, like plenty of worked examples. Um, it really gave us an understanding of the accounting and the GHD principles in there. Um, and we're even referring our, our clients to the carbon accounting for business course so that they can upskill themselves and become more involved in this process if they want to and just really understand what it is we're doing here and why we're asking them for the data that we're asking for. Perfect. Um, uh, Lisa, you guys have obviously been on the learning journey for a while now um, and you've gone through that yourself and also having junior staff go through it. How have you kind of found that and how do you guys go about, I guess, learning on the job as well? Yeah, I think I've found the most practical way for at least our graduates and our accountants ourselves to learn is actually doing the course at the same time as completing an assessment because it is 18 modules long and then within each of those modules, there's more modules. Uh, so it's a very in-depth course. It's almost like going back to uni, um, but having that practical examples alongside of completing the information as well um, provide you with the learning experience. Whereas if you're just reading through the theory, you kind of get lost in all of the terminology. Yeah, and I think something we see um, firms doing quite successfully uh, is you're balancing this thing, right? Oh, I don't want to look like a fool and not really understand the ins and outs of this and then go and tell a client that I can deliver this like perfect output that I'm definitely not confident in. Um, and it's balancing that with hey, this is a new area for you and for us. Um, there are accounting standards. We're across these. Uh, but in terms of the availability of the data or some edge cases we might need to work through with you, you know, we'd love to do that together. And I know early days as an accounting firm of how we really started getting into this was really pitching to those clients to say, like, let's collaboratively learn on where you're at and where you're going and where we have any gaps. Let's work through that with you. And you kind of come in on this playing field that, you're not saying that you're an expert in every single aspect of this, but you're saying I am the best place person as your trusted advisor that's already sitting within zero, that already understands a lot of this data and has a good handle on that protocol. I'm the best person that's placed to kind of go on that journey with you. And another course in here, that Carbon Accounting for Business, um, which unfortunately my head is on and I hate doing these and this will be my <laughs> last one that I am dragged in on on these courses. But a key uh, bit of feedback we got is a lot of firms have clients that end up saying, 
I want to actually understand a bit more about this as well. Like I would like to be a little bit more upskilled. So I understand the value of what my advisors or my accountant or my bookkeeper is doing. So there's another 10 chapter course in there that is really designed for those stakeholders in the business that might not need to know the absolute ins and outs of everything to do with the methodologies and disclosures and standards, but they need a high level understanding of why am I bothering basically to go through this or why am I being asked to find this kind of data? Um, so that course works for, um, I guess, clients who would like to upskill a little bit as well. Um, Emily, have you had clients going through that um, or how have you sort of found having the ability to help your clients upskill as well? Yeah, we found that to be really positive for the, the few clients who have decided to, to jump in and look at that. It just helps to open up that conversation and those discussions about uh, how we can be doing this better and what they might want to do after this, how they can really see um, after going through this course, how the actions that they're taking will reduce their emissions in the end. So it just really helps to open up that discussion. Yeah, and I think it's being like aware as um, advisors that there is this real opportunity to go on that learning journey with the client. And really what Someday is doing is sort of sitting behind um, you guys as accountants or bookkeepers and saying like, we're here to help provide you with the resources to provide that to your clients and to bring them along on that journey. Uh, and so we have an amazing relationships with so many firms that might say, and obviously, Emily, you're um, a great example of that. You know, my client keeps asking about this particular thing. I'm not 100% confident on going and giving some, you know, grand webinar about that particular topic, uh, but it's coming up again and again. Um, is this something that we can sort of address and, and do our own upskilling with someday on so we feel better about going and having that conversation? That's something that's happening all of the time and that's something that has to happen when for the very first time in a very long time, a whole new sort of area or discipline is coming into our profession. We have to be collaborative around how we build those resources and share them. And so we say it someday all the time, you know, we're education first. But you absolutely have to be to kind of make strides in this area. Um, the last one I'll just ask, Alyssa, I know that you recently um, gave a very big presentation um, to a, a government-owned entity, to a CFO and a finance team who are really deeply engaged about this and you sort of play some of that education role. How do you find that experience and when you're explaining these concepts, how is that being received and what do you do if you're not 100% sure of the answer? I think the biggest piece at the moment is most of our client work is everyone's doing a baseline. It's all new for everyone. So part of doing these baselines assessments is it's an education piece to the clients as well, teaching them what everything means, how the data is collected, what the impact can be of changing the data collection and reduction activities from those different pieces. So when presenting this to larger groups, uh, it's really about breaking down and simplifying it as much as possible so they can understand because otherwise you're trying to present a huge amount of information in a small amount of time and it usually just goes straight over everyone's head. So it's about simplifying it as much as possible and where there is questions that maybe I can't answer on the spot, we just take those away and report back later. Uh, everyone knows that it's such a huge area so they're pretty comfortable in providing an answer maybe the afternoon later or the next day. You can really rely on some of the Sunday support as well to assist where we're stuck and we don't know the complete answer as well. Yeah, 100%. I think it's just really important to, to touch on that and share that. I think a lot of people have this fear that should I dare step into the arena of carbon accounting uh, in my first client meeting or presentation, I'm going to be peppered with questions that I can't answer and, you know, feel like an idiot, but it couldn't really be further from the truth because A, everyone is really learning. So that sort of attack of questions is not, we've not really seen that play out. It is far more collaborative than that. So sort of stepping in and really doing that upskilling think the firms that have really grappled with that and really taken the time to do that across a broader team than just one person that has to wear, you know, the sustainability hat, 
the idea of turning all of your normal bookkeepers or accountants into people that have a general understanding of carbon accounting to allow those natural conversations to flow with the people that already have the relationships and then feed the deeper work into the actual teams that might be uh, even more advanced in terms of their learning on this. That just means that we're starting to weave this into business as usual, which is really where that space obviously needs to get to. Great. So I can see a few questions coming through around, um, all right, let's get into the nitty gritty. Where does the data live and uh, how does it pull through? So we have an integration with Xero. So obviously a lot of your clients are Xero users and for the carbon accounting, uh, you are basically pulling in all of the financial transactions um, for that reporting period uh, so that you can then go in and do, again, essentially this sort of cash coding or we call a carbon bookkeeping process in a carbon ledger in some day and you can see a screenshot of that now so if you've got that great file sitting in zero you're already pretty well advanced here you are just plugging and playing and pulling it through and i i know both of you guys are zero firm so i'll let you speak to this as well um, there's a question of oh, okay what if the client has some data outside of zero and certainly for some activity data it might not live in zero so again like pretty much you know all platforms you can still do your csv um, export and and upload in uh, but for the most part you're going to have this huge advantage from having so much data already sitting in zero and it really sort of it's very clear why there's such an advantage of the accountants and bookkeepers getting involved here because even where we see say perhaps ESG consultants um, coming in and doing this work rather than the accountant. It's just constant questions to the accountant around, can I access zero? What is a GL? Um, which I think is just demonstrates how much upskilling of the ESG or the uh, a consultant needs to be versus someone that's already in a firm with access to a lot of this information in the first place. So having that ability to import from there does save you a lot of time and obviously does make this a more efficient process. Um, Emily, you guys obviously use Xero across the firm. Uh, how have you found just the ability to, I guess, jump into both systems and do that import in terms of time save, but yeah, other areas where maybe there's still ways that you're trying to improve that? Yeah, so it's definitely really streamlined, streamlined the process of being able to jump in here, connect to Xero, bring everything through, uh, does that in the background while you go and work on something else, which is really great. Um, and then to be able to see see everything there, know that you've got everything um, and you're not worrying, or oh, have I accidentally excluded something I shouldn't have? Um, it, it's a really great function. Um, and like Alyssa said, if if you've gone through in the zero file first and you've tidied that up, then really you don't need to be looking elsewhere very much. If you do, you know, for us, uh, knowing our clients has, has been a big help. So maybe there's something in the zero file that's not totally clear um, but being their accountant and in some cases their bookkeeper as well, we know them and we don't have to go back and ask them this question. We already know where that goes. So that's been a huge um, advantage to working with our, our existing clients on this. Amazing. Um, I'll give a tangible example of when we were an accounting firm and we were working for a mining client um, and we didn't even really think about the carbon accounting as a service for them at the time. And uh, we suddenly got this request from the person we had had the key relationship with for over a year saying, we realise we need to do carbon accounting. Um, we've engaged this consultant um, who we've not met before. Uh, here is the uh, list of RFIs of data that they need from you. And we just realised that essentially we were doing the uh, carbon accounting. Uh, and we were providing every input and we were going through and checking and validating everything. And that was kind of this first realisation that you know, that was quite a significant engagement in the tens of thousands that had gone to a consultant with no prior relationship or understanding of this client or their data whatsoever. Uh, and we were coming in really after the fact, doing a lot of that work. So I think having access to this is a huge advantage. Uh, Alyssa, most of the firm is zero. How have you guys found the improved efficiencies? Yeah, I think by having the import directly from zero and the general ledger just pulling straight through, it really 
proves the auditability because we know everything's there. The full general ledger's there from the date you imported it in. Whereas by doing it via CSV in Excel, it's pretty likely that you've got that human error where a line's missing or you've accidentally deleted an amount. Um, so it really improves the accuracy. And as Emily said, by pulling in the data directly from zero after we've made some improvements, that means we don't have to go digging for a lot of the invoices as well. Perfect. Um, I'll go to the next one and I'll address your um, great questions here, Peter, as well. So what we have been talking about is pulling in the financial uh, data and basically multiplying that by the industry average based on what category of emissions and the source of emissions we put that under. So just be really practical again. Okay, I've taken uh, $1,000 that I spent at JB Hi-Fi on laptops. I have chose my emissions category, say so that's scope three. Um, I'll choose a subcategory of you know, capital goods and I'll choose an emission source of uh, electronics and white goods, I think the category is, for example. So I'm going through and doing that process. That as you're kind of highlighting um, here as well, Peter, is if we're doing the whole thing on spend, how do we account for reductions? So if that company had gone and made a change in their process or, you know, now everything's being manufactured on renewable energy or whatever it might be, or the price went up for whatever you're using, let's say you're a farmer and the price of grain or fertilizer went through the roof, but you'd actually halved it so that your emissions would you know, realistically be going down as well but the price has gone up and your whole calculation has been driven on cost. How are you ever really going to be able to account for that reduction uh, credibly? And what we can't do and maintain sort of, I guess, the audit trail and the credibility is say, well, you know, because we did X or because we think they went and reduced emissions, um, we're just going to put in like a hard-coded assumption on a reduction, full stop. You know, this is really getting to the core of the problem around not having accountants in the arena and not having primary data available from our clients. So to go macro for a moment, it's one thing to look at what is the accountant's role in delivering a valuable service to clients from that compliance or marketing perspective. But there is a really bigger picture piece here where if your client actually wants to start tracking reduction, then they need to go out and look at all of their suppliers or all of their inputs and get some primary data and be able to account for the reduction that those companies are achieving or be able to account for the activity data reaction. So reduction in liters or tons or whatever else versus just letting price sort of impact this calculation. And so the macro of that is the opportunity for the accounting profession is if we're not all in on this together and saying this needs to become part of business as usual, needs to be accessible to the local baker as much as it is to Rio Tinto. If we're not all facilitating that just as we do, you know, financial accounting or helping with a tax return, whether they're a tiny business or an enormous one, then we're forever going to be dealing with this really low fidelity um, finance you know, price only driven data and calculations, which really means that we're all going to be stuck in this frustrated world where to actually account for those reductions gets harder and harder. We need to be unlocking that primary data so that we can account for that. So I think there's a huge opportunity for the profession to unlock a new era in the robustness and the availability of that data by actually all embedding this as a process. But certainly a key thing around this is, can I get the primary data? Can I demonstrate the reduction? And so one thing we really want to talk to is around how um, someday it tackles this, where you might have done all of that work in the carbon ledger, you've pulled in the zero data, that's fantastic. This sort of next layer, which everyone kind of, you know, in media you'll hear, oh, scope three, absolutely terrifying, we can't do it. But really we sort of say, we'll just, you know, first of all, ask the question. So for your client, let's take the coffee shop again. Let's say they have 200 suppliers. You actually want to understand the emissions of the actual beans, right? Um, not just the industry average coming from the government or an academic database. So you upload the contact details um, for those suppliers, and then you send off a request saying, can you provide me with this data? 
Now, 98% of the population are going to say no right now. Um, I cannot provide you with audit ready, cradle to gate data in line with the GHG protocol, right? Because it's new to them. And so then rather than just stop the conversation there, what Someday does is say, okay, you know, everyone's coming along on this journey. We're going to give you free access to the tool if you need it and if you want it. We're going to give you free access to um, the Someday Academy so you can upskill on why we're asking for this information and how to deliver it internally. But we'll also help on board your existing accountant so that they can actually access these tools and resources to get on with it as well. Now, you can track obviously the response rates of that and over time try and improve the quality of that data. Uh, but that as a starting point is really, really key um, as best practice, asking the question, trying to get the information. Um, Emily, Alyssa, I might just touch on you. Um, Emily, you've been going really deep on this lately around trying to get this. How have you found that sort of process um, and how are clients thinking about this as well? Yeah, so mostly our clients have been really keen to um, have us go out and, and talk to all of their suppliers and, and ask for this information. And it's definitely been one of the more challenging parts of completing an assessment. Um, a big part of it has been just trying to find the right person to ask this question to, to make sure that it gets answered and it gets answered correctly. And the other part of it has been really just communicating to clients why they're actually receiving receiving this. And so we've been having a lot of uh, a lot of conversations with suppliers about how they fit into the picture and, and why a client is asking this and, and just emphasizing to them that, yeah, they can ignore this if they want, but this client might be considering changing their procurement policies. And so they might end up losing a customer over this. Great. Um, Alyssa, how have you guys sort of found this uh, process and I guess like engagement with other firms, other accountants or CFOs as you go through it? I think we found this probably one of the most informative pieces of the assessment, especially at the moment because everyone's starting. It's really showing who is likely to be interested, especially for our bigger clients, who's going to start doing it now so they can improve and who might not even be interested even into the future. Um, so it's really about the information rather than getting that primary data at the moment because we all know, especially where we're located specifically for us, most of our clients aren't and their suppliers aren't either. Yeah, 100%. I think like it's becoming really valuable because um, you bring clients up the, the speed really quickly where they're first of all, what is carbon accounting? And then it's like, oh, there's some numbers. Where did they come from? Oh, a good portion of this was industry averages based on your spend data. Next question. Well, I purposefully engage with these suppliers because they're great and they're really sustainable or, you know, Joe's only down the road doing this stuff. Like why would it be an industry average? Joe's better than that. So you very quickly get into this which is amazing because then you start to have this real value to say, well, these are the suppliers that are engaging. These are the ones that are not. Why is that? Do you have a role to play in how you can help them move the needle on that? How do we get to a point where this is a higher fidelity assessment? That journey is just so valuable and we see clients getting a lot out of that just, just on the stats initially alone. So that's great. Cool, and starting to wrap up here. So um, we've spoke a lot about how Someday is really education first. We have a lot of the courses, but what we're really trying to do as well is kind of pull this into your workflow. So if you're sitting there and wondering, oh, you know, what is scope one, two or three again, or, you know, some of those key things as you're going through, you don't want to have to go back into the course, back into the sub course, go back into the notes. Obviously, we're entering a world where you want that at your fingertips more and more. So very experimental at this stage, but we are sort of pulling in that ability to query a lot of those um, marketing, uh, sorry, educational materials um, and course materials into your fingertips so you can actually ask those questions as you go. And yeah, finally, here from me, you know, it's about adding value to clients at the end of the day. Um, and so really understanding how that actually plays out and how to present this information back is really key to that. It's probably not um, an effective uh, BD strategy to just put the fear of God into every client and say, if you don't do this, it's going to be a disaster. Um, they often don't respond that well to this. 
the first point is like, why is this going to actually be valuable to you or give you a point of difference or a competitive edge or demonstrate that you're a leader? How can we embed this on your websites or QR to your products? Like, how do we actually make this your strategy? Not just you're the one being hammered from above and we all now need to knee jerk response. Uh, taking that more holistic view, I think, is really powerful. And I think a lot of advisors are starting to do a really great job of that. So we have quite a few templates and examples that you can lean on to do that as well. And then, yeah, we're obviously in the Zero App Store. So you can check that out. You can trial any of this without a card or anything for two weeks so you can play around. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Jess and Emily and Alyssa for your insights uh, as accounting practitioners. Um, it's been great to have you with us today. And thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.